Hi YouTube, this is one of a series of videos looking at the documentary A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Moon, produced by Bart Sabrell. You will hear me mention him quite a lot. Check out my channel for other videos in the series, or for the box set where you can watch them all in one feature length video. Hi YouTube, in this video I will be looking at the documentary A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Moon, produced by Bart Sibrell. I did actually tackle this in an earlier video, but this was right at the start of my YouTube career, and I think I can do a better job now. I also made the mistake of addressing only the main so-called smoking gun evidence from the documentary. This resulted in many comments from hoax believers who simply denied this as being important and chose some other claim from the film as their personal smoking gun. So this time around I intend to address every single claim that is made in the film. Many of the popular arguments made by Apollo hoaxes come straight from this movie, so I hope this video will act as a useful resource for debunking hoax and claims in general rather than just a debunk of the movie itself. Finally, before we go any further, I want to make an important point to any flat earthers who are here. The main claim in A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Moon is that the Apollo missions were faked using terrestrial sound stages and footage shot from manned space flights in low Earth orbit. Almost without exception, flat earthers do not believe that manned space flights in low Earth orbit are in any way possible. So if this is your view, you must reject this movie as being fundamentally flawed in what it says is its most important premise. I find it astounding that many flat earthers hold this movie up as a killer blow to the Apollo moon landings when they cannot possibly believe its main smoking gun claim is even possible, let alone true. Since the beginning of recorded history, the human race has been at war. First with members of their own family, then their fellow countrymen, and finally nations at large. The film starts by proposing that human beings have an inherent warlike nature. It goes on to tell the stories first of the Tower of Babel, and then of the maiden voyage of the Titanic. These two examples are used to imply that when human beings allow their dreams to get too big, they are inclined to end in failure. The final part of this introduction section introduces the Cold War space race, highlighting the early successes of the Soviet Union and suggesting that because the Hubble Space Telescope had issues with its mirror when it was launched in 1990, this somehow indicates that the Apollo moon landings could not have been successful. The introduction concludes with this. With close scrutiny of the motives of the zealous Nixon administration, a critical examination of the entirely government-controlled press coverage, and newly discovered footage of the crew of Apollo 11 staging part of their mission, we wish to detail what may come to be the greatest government conspiracy of all time. A funny thing happened on the way to the moon. The introduction is followed by yet more scene setting. First we get two minutes of missile tests and failed launches, the implication being that the early US space program was just a series of disasters. This is followed by some quotes about the challenges faced by the space program from head of the Apollo program, Werner von Braun, head of the US Army Ballistic Missile Command, Major General John Madaris, and Presidents John F. Kennedy and Lyndon B. Johnson. Finally, we're treated to a full two and a half minutes of the launch of Apollo 11, coupled with some weirdly creepy music, and juxtaposed with footage of famine, war, and social unrest. Part 1. The Van Allen Radiation Belts Now we get to one of the main claims made in the movie, a point which Sibrel repeatedly returns to throughout, that the Van Allen radiation belts cannot be crossed by human beings. Here are some excerpts of the arguments presented to establish this point. Unbeknownst to the citizenry, high above the earth, lay lethal bands of radiation called the Van Allen radiation belts. 
Every space mission in history with humans on board has been well below this deadly radiation field. In order to survive the hour and a half journey through this radiation field necessary to reach the moon and return, solid lead shielding between the astronauts and the exposure outside would be required. That is why the Soviets, though more advanced, only sent an unmanned probe to the moon. The Apollo spacecraft's narrowest shielding was less than one-eighth of an inch of light aluminum. In 1998, the space shuttle flew to an altitude of 350 miles, one of its highest altitudes ever, that the astronauts inside of their shielded spacecraft and inside of their shielded spacesuits saw flashes of light with their eyes shut due to radiation penetrating the retinas of their closed eyes. As a result, CNN issued the following report, noting NASA's unpredicted surprise. The radiation belt surrounding Earth may be more dangerous for spacewalking astronauts than previously believed. Scientists say the phenomena known as the Van Allen belts can spawn killer electrons when the Earth's magnetic field changes. The possibility of These charged particles surrounding the Earth have been investigated prior to the space age by scientists such as Christian Birkeland, Carl Stormer and Nicholas Christophilis. The first US satellite, Explorer 1, under James Van Allen of the University of Iowa, made the first detection of the belts in 1958, although this was initially thought to be a fault in the detector, but was later confirmed by the Explorer 3 satellite and by subsequent US and Soviet satellites. This was the first major scientific discovery of the space age, and it was heavily publicised in popular media. It made James Van Allen a household name. Newspapers even wrote articles about his wife and home life, so the claim that the public were unaware of the radiation belts is obviously untrue. The Gemini 4 mission was flown through the South Atlantic anomaly, a part of the radiation belts which drops close to the Earth, specifically for the purposes of testing the spacecraft's radiation shielding capabilities. Gemini 10 also carried three radiation experiments and flew over 400 miles from Earth to make its radiation measurements. Although the Soviets did not send humans through the radiation belts, they did send and recover a collection of live animals on their Zond 5 mission. This was the first spacecraft to orbit the moon and it carried a biological payload of two Russian tortoises, wine flies, mealworms, plants, seeds, bacteria and other living matter the first Earth life forms to travel around the Moon and return safely. All other spacecraft since Apollo have maintained low Earth orbits, so by definition only they avoid the radiation belts. Solid lead shielding is used for protection against X-rays and gamma rays. These are produced by nuclear reactions, atomic bombs and to a much lesser degree nuclear reactors. This is not the type of radiation that forms the Van Allen radiation belts, which are made up of high energy charged particles from the sun, alpha particles, beta particles and protons that become trapped by the Earth's magnetic field, creating inner and outer donut shaped belts around the Earth. This protects humans on Earth from any detrimental effects, but creates a potential hazard for space travellers. Alpha particles are very large and so don't penetrate very deeply into many things, in fact, alpha particles will not even penetrate the outer layer of our skin and so present no special hazard to humans. A sheet of reasonably thick paper will block all alpha particles. Protons penetrate further. They can be shielded by light metals or plastics in thicknesses of about a centimetre, such as the aluminium skin of the Apollo craft and its epoxy resin heat shield. Beta particles are very small and can penetrate centimetres into the body, but luckily they're too small to cause much damage if they hit anything. But there's a special problem here. When beta particles hit large atoms, the impact causes those atoms to give off X-rays. Metal atoms are usually quite heavy, and so are especially susceptible to this kind of re-radiation, which is known by its German name, Bremsstrahlung. In fact, this is how X-rays are produced intentionally for medical applications. So solid lead shielding would be one of the worst possible materials to use as it would generate a lot of dangerous x-rays. The best materials to shield against beta particles have lots of hydrogen atoms in them. Hydrogen atoms are light and so absorb the particles without giving off x-rays. Plain old water works very well, but water is impractical for shielding in space 
So high density polyethylene, which contains lots of hydrogen atoms, is frequently used instead. This also effectively blocks protons. The hull of the Apollo command module contained a layer of fibrous insulation material that would have offered similar protection along with its inner aluminium hull. Radiation exposure is cumulative, meaning that the longer you're exposed to it, the worse the effect it has. So the NASA mission plans chose a route that avoided the inner radiation belt entirely and avoided the most dangerous part of the outer belt. This diagram shows the trajectory of an Apollo craft around the most dangerous parts of the radiation belts. The red dots here represent 10 minute intervals, so we can see that the exposure times were very limited. We also know the radiation dose of each astronaut because they wore dosimeters and regularly reported the readings to mission control, and these readings are recorded in the Apollo flight journal. This claim seems to be based on Sibrel's belief that radiation shielding needs to be bulky. The heat shield was 5 cm thick at the deepest parts, but such measurements are largely irrelevant. The command module shielding was just part of the radiation exposure reduction strategy. CNN reported only that the Van Allen belts were slightly larger in places and slightly denser than previously understood. This is not a new reality, merely a refinement of existing figures. We are still studying the Van Allen belts and must occasionally revise our numerical models. We can see just from this first section that Sibrel has mischaracterized the Van Allen radiation belts as an impassable barrier, so deadly they had to be kept secret from the public. The evidence shows that this is simply not the case and is an idea that relies on a fundamental misunderstanding of the physics involved. In the next part we will see how this mischaracterization technique continues with an assessment of the early space program and is used to present hoax as the only option available to NASA. Thanks for watching. Please rate, comment and subscribe.